Hey, everybody, welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. Um, right now, across the United States, up to 25%, 25% of our high schools do not offer more than one of the basic courses in high school math and science education, 25%. And 47.2% of rural districts do not have a single student in any AP course at all. Almost 50% of our students in rural America have no access at all to AP English, AP Science, AP Math. Young people, as they tell us and want to keep reminding us, are our future, right? But damn, we're failing the hell out of them when we can't even give them access to the possibility of improving their quality of life, improving their educational opportunities by positioning them through sound academic programs. So I asked a friend of mine to stop by who was actually trying to do that. His name is Matt Dolan. He's the founder and CEO of the Global Teaching Project, which provides promising high school students in rural and underserved areas across the country access to advanced courses that they will need to help them fulfill their full potential. You're gonna enjoy this conversation, folks. I know it. Coming up next with Matthew Dolan, the Global Teaching Project, right here on the Michael Steele Podcast, right after this. Well, everybody, welcome again to the Michael Steele Podcast. Uh, it's great to have you uh, in the house as we have a, a conversation that is quite honestly beneath the radar screen for, for most Americans when it comes to what is happening in education, particularly in some of the poorest communities in our country. Um, we get caught up in the politics of education and we forget about the kids. We forget that they're teachers who are trying to teach. They're students who actually do want to learn, believe it or not. Um, and there are a lot of very special men and women out there who are trying to make all of that happen. One of those individuals is a is an old friend of mine whom I have uh, a great deal of respect for and admire, uh, not just for the work he's doing now, but because he's consistent in that work. It is something that comes out of uh, and a part of his history of being interested in getting it done right and, and making opportunities available. Matt Dolan, welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. It is such a treat to have you, my friend. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, you are you are doing some incredibly good work, um, uh, as I noted. And, and in the intro, I, I referenced the fact that there is such a huge a proportion of high schools, about a quarter of high schools that do not offer more than one basic course in high school math and science. A lot of people give a lot of lip service to STEM um, and, and AP programs, but you're actually trying to make that a reality for the kids in Mississippi through uh, a, a project that you developed um, and launched the Global Teaching Project. So let's let's start with what is the Global Te Teaching Project? Um, and what inspired you to kind of create this at this moment? Well, thank you. The, the Global Teaching Project, what we do is basically we try to provide educational opportunity to students who uh, otherwise wouldn't have it. it, it it's really that simple. The, the origin, uh, I, I often think I need to come up with a better origin story because <laughs> basically the origin story is uh, deciding to do it. Right. And, and uh, so basically the, the notion is uh, all of us, and I know this is true of you, it's true of myself, it's true of my wife, we, we do our best to provide the best possible educational opportunity for our kids. Uh, that's not something I'm inclined to apologize for. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something I think every parent should strive for. But I've always been very mindful that not everyone has the same opportunities that we were able to afford our children. So six, a little over six years ago, uh, we set out 
to establish a program. We knew we couldn't change the world. So we tried to identify a very specific niche where there was an opportunity to do well. And so what we have done in rural Mississippi for the last six years is we have sought and successfully been able to offer advanced STEM courses uh, to promising rural students in high poverty communities in Mississippi who otherwise would not have the opportunity to take these courses. Uh, these courses are essential if these kids are gonna achieve their full potential, uh, but their schools in many, many cases simply could not offer these courses in part because of, of limited resources, but mostly because they simply could not get the teachers. So what we do again is we offer promising high school students in rural high poverty communities with an initial focus on Mississippi, though we are looking to expand and working toward expanding, but we offer them access to advanced STEM courses they otherwise would not have access to, but which they need to achieve their full potential. That's fascinating to me. So you, you're you're taking kids in a school district that um, are otherwise not just uh, financially poor, but educationally poor as well. You're bringing in um, the Global Teaching Project to work with what to work with these students. What was the initial resist? There had to have been initial resistance to this idea. They hear you got, you know, you got this, this, uh, this Yankee coming in um, and, and going to tell us how to educate our kids uh, kind of deal. But you're looking around and you're seeing, well, your kids aren't necessarily getting access to the best education possible. We have some tools to help. What was that conversation like initially? Well, and what must it, it be it, like now? <laughs> it, it, it was remarkably simple. Uh, you know, I, I, I am mindful of the fact that that my principal contact uh, initially there still refers to me as his favorite Yankee lawyer. Uh, <laughs> and I still don't quite know how to take that. Uh, <laughs> but 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 the conversation was was remarkably easy. And I think the key to it was two things. One, you know, we've all heard about the 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 meme, uh, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon that everybody right. knows everybody else. In Mississippi, it's two degrees. I mean, it is a small community, particularly in these rural communities. And what served us very, very well is is two things. One, initially, I went in uh, to these communities with someone they trusted who could vouch right. for me. And, and very quickly, that no longer was necessary because I, I came to know people myself. The second, and this is critical, is I physically went to these places and I went back to them and I went back to them again and again. And they got to know me because very, very few people go to Marks or Ecru or, or uh, Shelby, Mississippi. Uh, they, they simply don't. And the fact that I was there conferred credibility. The fact that initially I was accompanied by someone they trusted, uh, and I had some some connections with the state because of my work on Capitol Hill. Uh, I, I knew some members of the, the delegation, uh, and particularly at the staff level, who introduced me to some folks. Although very quickly, that was no longer necessary because people came to know me because right. I physically went to these places. And the conversation went a little bit like this. The first thing I said, and this much... I, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but but this much I understood about uh, politics and, and just economic reality. First thing I said in each of these meetings, and it usually would be with a superintendent, perhaps one other staffer, because these are very small school districts. You, you will have uh, sometimes in the entire district uh, fewer than a thousand students. Right. So I would say, first thing, I'm not here to take your job. I'm not here to uh, compete with you. I'm not here uh, to take your money, and uh, that's a big point. I'm I'm here to provide you a service that we will identify the money to pay for, which we've had some success in doing, uh, and we will do this in a way to help your students, and we hope help you look good in the process. And with that, that was a a sixty second prelude. 
And that was all they needed. And they didn't push back. They understood it. They accepted it. And then we moved to the substantive discussion. And it was really remarkable how simple it proved to be. Again, because I was there, I was talking to them. And I would say, uh, in essence, I'd explain what we were doing. And time after time, they would say, you know, this is really needed because there are a number of programs in place to help our kids who are struggling. But we don't have anything for our kids who are potential high achievers. They exhaust the curriculum, they go through all the classes, and by late in their high school careers, they're twirling their thumbs or taking courses that are of no, no particular value to them. That is That to me is the most essential part of this, this work because it's something I discovered as Lieutenant Governor and looking at our educational system here in Maryland and trying to figure out how to reform it. And, and of course, the, the mantra that I put in front of the education community, as well as the business community uh, and the general public was, I wanted to understand and appreciate education through the eyes of a child, mm -hmm. not through the teachers unions, not through the anti-teachers unions groups, not through the politicians, but the teachers, and, and more especially the, the students who are in the system, because the point you just made is something I think a lot of people don't appreciate. We have kids who are damn sight sh just short of Einstein languishing in our school systems in many instances because of, because of the environment they're in, the conditions of their academic access um, and, and opportunities, uh, the lack of resources for them, they get to a point where it's not hitting a wall. They are absolutely pancaked into the wall and they give up. The system takes over. They get lost. They get shuffled. Then all the other roads to nowhere, crime, poverty, et cetera, are the only venues uh, and access points left to them. What you're doing um, through the Global Teacher Teaching Project is saying, we see these students, we know their capability, and we want to put them on this path with the help of the school system, right? Buy-in of the teachers and everybody else, but this is the path we want to get them on because we don't want them to pancake into that wall of poverty, pancake into that wall of crime, but rather we want them to go around that wall, to go over that wall, to go through that wall, to a better future. That's a different mindset in the programming that you're doing. What does the program look like? How is it shaped? How do you identify these students? What are the courses they're taking since there's such an array of subject matter, whether it's English, whether it's math or science or whatever, that they can access on an AP level? Well, I, I agree with everything you, you say, and, and I would just add briefly before addressing your question more specifically, all of the issues you identify are very, very real everywhere in America. What I have learned is they are particularly prominent in rural communities. And the, the reason for that is this, in urban areas, there at least is the possibility of students identifying other options, uh, charter schools, parochial schools, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. where high, very promising kids, high aptitude promising kids have the prospect of perhaps finding an, a, a challenging academic environment. If you are from a very lightly populated rural county, and Mississippi actually has is the third most uh, rural state in the country in terms of the percentage of students who attend school in a rural district. The only option, if you're in a county of, for example, one of the counties we serve has 8,500 residents, they can only sustain one high school and that barely. Mm -hmm. uh, so the smartest kids in that community are at that high school. However, they have an awfully hard time in finding the, the curriculum, the courses that they need to achieve their full potential. So what we do, is we offer AP STEM courses. Most of our schools uh, uh, offered no APs at all before we went to work with them. Uh, many offered one or two in, in but uh, generally speaking, we would be the first AP course they offered. And, and here's a stat I found so 
remarkable and, and, and frankly distressing. I checked my math. I'm not the greatest in math, but I checked my math about five times because I was looking through as you know, many of us do for entertainment through a government accountability. Oh yeah, yeah that's a Saturday night. <laughs> yes. So a, 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 a government accountability office uh, report from 2018 that was sort of talking about educational opportunity. And they had a statistic. Well, they didn't have a statistic. They had tables of data and I did some calculations. Uh, what I found, and again, I checked it multiple times because it was such an arresting figure of large low poverty high schools, over a thousand students uh, and less than 25% of the student body qualifies for fury or reduced lunches. 70, or I'm sorry, 99% of those high schools, large low poverty high schools offered eight piece, 99% for small high poverty high schools. Uh -huh which is 75% or more free and reduced lunch uh, students, 11%. Wow. 99% versus 11. Now, who do you think has the better prospect for no matter what their aptitude may be, no matter what their work ethic may be, who do you think has the better prospect uh, longitudinally as they proceed through college and, and beyond about excelling at a high level? So we offer a series of courses uh, AP Physics, AP uh, Computer Science, AP Biology, and we we package this in a way it is not an online course. It is a blended course. There is a classroom instructor. We offer a range of supports to those classroom uh, instructors, uh, lesson plans, computers, textbooks, uh, ancillary materials, tutoring, uh, professional development. Uh, we have uh, tutors from some of the best schools in the country, uh, several Mississippi universities, also Yale uh, and UVA actually happen to be our two biggest uh, sources. I was going to say because you had you've had some big names drop in in these classrooms and teach. I yeah. mean, folks, when I say I'm saying big, I'm talking like Nobel laureates. That's <laughs> absolutely correct. <laughs> you so, got, we had... so just can we just check this point for folks who are listening? This brother is bringing in Nobel laureates to teach the, the lowest in, in the academic, at the academic level considered um, by many students who otherwise wouldn't have access to these types of individuals to come in and teach these kids AP physics, AP biology, and they're doing it. They're signing up to do this. That's right. And we have faculty and students from Yale, Virginia, MIT, Harvard, Columbia, Penn, Notre Dame. <laughs> in Mississippi. Uh, in Mississippi. We have uh, uh, one teacher who is the author of the, the most widely used uh, biology textbook in the country. We have, as you mentioned, a, a Nobel laureate in physics, which was an interesting experience. Uh, <laughs> his name is uh, Rainer Weiss. Uh, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for detecting gravitational waves uh, relating to the origins of the universe. And when I, I spoke to our students about this, I, it, it was a, a wonderful experience and he did a great job. But I, I sought to explain to our students, I said, I know your seventh grade reading award is, is very impressive. <laughs> I, I, I acknowledge that and, and, and I, I really, you know, laud you for that. But you need to understand the Nobel Prize in physics is not quite at the same level. It's a little bit higher. <laughs> and, and still, I think a lot of our students, but again, this is the value of the programs we do. I, I don't think they, they understood fully what, what that meant, but they began to. And yeah, it's they do now. They and get it now. Uh, and we also bring them, we have residential programs at, at, at Mississippi universities. We have a summer program uh, over 15 days where we prepare students to take these classes because even though they are smart, they are often, uh, you know, have major gaps in their, their substantive foundations. We just finished a program uh, a few days ago at Jackson State University. Uh, where we brought in students. Uh, we had about 200 participants. 
Uh, we brought them in for immersive instruction in, in physics, biology, computer so science. Can we, can yeah. I, I wanna, I'm glad you mentioned Jackson State because I think what's important for people to understand what's the environment in which you are doing this work is the environment in which these students live every day. Right. So we're talking about students living in a, in a state and in communities within that state who, as you worried uh, about over the Martin Luther King, leading up to the Martin Luther King uh, holiday weekend in which you were doing this program for about 200 students, they had no water, people. Yes. You're talking about you're talking about students living in you, if folks aren't aware of what's happening in Mississippi right now with respect to the water, right? You're trying to put on these programs and incentivize these students to learn. And you're battling with, okay, can we even host the program because the students have no water? How do you how do you make that work? Well, it's it that that's part of the the lesson as well. As I sort of move out of the sunlight here, uh -huh. uh, the you know it's it's that's part of the lesson. Uh, it's resilience, and and the fact is we did not know until a few days before the program if we could have the program. Uh, Jackson State, the Jackson State campus, and much of the city of Jackson had no water between uh, basically a week or so before Christmas until well into January. You turn the tap, nothing happens. Uh, incredibly, it's a persistent problem that uh, they still fully haven't resolved. So, you know, we went ahead planning in the hopes they, they would resolve it. Ultimately, they did at least temporarily. But yes, it, it is a crazy situation. But, you know... <laughs> Our students, uh, you know, bless them, they they roll with it and we roll with it. Uh, uh, and we just proceeded on the optimistic assumption, which happily proved to be true, that somebody would patch the pipes in time because the the issue, it, it is such a fundamental issue. There There is two issues. There is an issue of water quality and then there is an issue of water pressure. So sometimes what? it's water oh quality uh, the treatment of the water is is problematic, but but more recently the problem was there were so many leaks in the system, there was no water pressure, and so you turn the tap, nothing happens. Uh, happily, oh. the week before we got there, uh, and and we're we're very appreciative to the people at Jackson State for working with us and their patience, but uh, it was resolved in time for us to hold the program. We're talking with Matt Dolan um, and the work that he's doing through uh, the Global Teaching Project. We're going to take a quick break. and When we come back, we're going to explore a little bit more the range of this program and the profound impact it's having on uh, poor students, um, at least in the one state of Mississippi, uh, which hopefully will be uh, some more states down the road right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele podcast. Uh, we are talking education. We're talking about AP courses for uh, poor uh, students, um, particularly uh, poor students of color uh, in the state of Mississippi through a program founded by Matt Dolan, the Global Teaching Project. Um, so, Matt, when we when we uh, before I went to break, we were talking about the quality of life essentially of the students uh, in this community dealing with no water, poor water, um, having to go to school, trying to learn, resources unavailable, and yet you've been able to carve out this niche um, where it becomes this sort of safe space for these kids who have enormous potential to learn. Give us a sense of now that you've been doing this for six years, what have you seen in the progress of these students? What impact is this global teaching project having on these poor kids in their future opportunities? Um, is it just, oh yeah, I took an AP course and that was great, or are they going on and excelling 
beyond your program? Are you tracking that? What what can you tell us about that aspect of the work? Well, certainly we have a range of outcomes and we understand we're going to have a range of outcomes. We have, uh, you know, we had a student uh, uh, who, who was with our program last year, got into MIT and, and he deserved to get into in MIT. It was not a gift. He, he earned it. Uh, we have students who, uh, you know, they, 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 some of them may be somewhat overmatched, uh, but I am convinced of this, and, and I have seen this, that everybody in our program who puts in the effort, and the great majority do, learns a whole lot, and it puts them on a different trajectory. Now, they may not uh, uh, crush the AP exam. Some of them do. Uh, not all of them do, but but although I am a uh, a proponent of standardized tests, I also recognize their limitations. And really, it is not for our kids. Uh, the The objective is not to get a certain score on the AP, although obviously we are attentive to that. It's to change the trajectory they're on, and more specifically to come closer to achieving their full potential. So you're talking about kids who otherwise, in some cases, likely wouldn't be even considering college. So whether whether or not whether or not they're going to MIT is one thing, but to the idea of changing that trajectory, um, helping them appreciate that they they can be academically competitive, they can consider a future that may otherwise not be there for them based on their their economic status, uh, et cetera. Yeah, the the I, I don't like to claim credit for things that that I do not deserve credit for. Right. And and to be honest, a lot of our kids are bound for college mm -hmm. uh, because they are smart kids, uh, and and they tend to be the uh, by design the, the high achievers in their school. But what what changes is when they go to college, where they choose to go to college, what they choose to study, whether they are able to, to persist in college, whether they are able to excel in college. For example, we have one of many of our graduates. Uh, we had a, a young woman uh, with whom we still uh, work closely, even though she is in college. Uh, she went to high school in a county. There's 3,141 counties approximately in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, excluding a single county with a tiny population that sort of skews the numbers a little bit. She went to the only public high school in the United States, in, in, in a county that had the lowest median income in the United States mm. out of over 3,000 counties. And the counties we serve, the communities we serve, uh, to a large extent by different metrics are not just among the poorest places in America, they are the poorest places in America. Mm -hmm. But this, this woman uh, went off to college. Uh, she went to an HBCU. She went to a summer program for prospective STEM majors. And they sort of plucked her out. They said, hey, you, you kind of know this stuff already. Mm -hmm. And and so they basically... Uh, uh, nominated her, and she ultimately was awarded a National Science Foundation grant so that she receives a stipend every month, and she will continue receiving a stipend every month subject to a certain uh, academic performance through graduate school. And she got it going to a freshman year. Now, she probably would have gone to college already. And so mm -hmm. I don't claim that we caused her to go to college. However, we did position herself to position her to get that National Science Foundation uh, grant that will make an enormous difference in her life. Right, right. And her on a very different trajectory. And, and we have numerous examples of that. Now, you know, we don't pretend we have magic pixie dust and we sprinkle it and, and these kids all of a sudden are, you know, bound, uh, uh, to become uh, Nobel laureates themselves, but we recognize their potential. We put them in peer groups of others, particularly through these residential programs, particularly through our tutoring, 
that when they they are tutored with from somebody from one of these very uh, selective schools, they realize that you know if you go to Stanford or MIT or Virginia or, or Harvard or Yale, wherever it happens to be, that you know you're not a Martian, you're not green, you don't have antennas, that they're regular people with whom you can relate right. and you can converse and you can can think like them, and it it what it transforms. And, and ultimately, this means it transforms their future. It transforms their conception of themselves. What do, they, what, I was going to say, what do teachers, how do teachers respond to this program? Um, you know, the physics teachers, the math and science teachers in, in these p- particular schools, do they work with uh, you in the program in some capacity? I mean, how, how has been the feedback from, from the teachers uh, and parents for that matter? Well, generally, the, the 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 outcome of the 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 response of the teachers is is quite positive. Uh, and again, when you take a range of human beings, you're going to have a range of responses. Mm-hmm. We offer uh, our first year again, as as you've noted, this is our sixth year. Our first year, we offered nine courses in a single subject, which was physics. This year, we offer sixty seven classes in at uh, thirty three high schools. Uh, in uh, physics, biology, computer science. And so you get 67 classes, you have a range of teachers and they respond in different ways. Right. But generally the responses are very positive. Perhaps our greatest single success is that a number of our teachers have gone on to receive AP certifications themselves, which in Mississippi, rural Mississippi, you know, oh. it's... It, <laughs> no. Uh, it's, it's probably, that's a game but, changer right there. That's a yeah. game changer right there. Yeah, because, you know, it is probably more likely a unicorn will stroll into the lobby of these schools than a physics teacher. Right. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Uh, many of our teachers are, are uh, very enthused about helping their students. Uh, uh, I often think that 80 percent of of the efficacy of a teacher depends on motivation. Uh, and he and she or she works very hard to, to help their students. You know, sometimes, guess what? You deal with a range of humans and sometimes you sort of have to remind them, please read your email. Right. <laughs> this, please do that. But but again, the, the dynamics of these smaller communities, and, and I'll be honest, I was you know, I didn't spend much time in rural America before doing this, but but rural communities tend to be very small, very cohesive. Everybody knows each other. Everybody knows each other's business, which can be a plus or a minus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and in these communities in rural Mississippi, particularly in places like the Mississippi Delta, there's very little in-migration. So what that means is that everybody knows these kids uh, the teachers tend to be sort of invested in them personally. It's not just a job. This is the communities they've lived in all their life. And they welcome the support that we provide. How how, how have you assessed, because um, the, the point you made about some of the teachers now going on and getting AP certification um, and creating, again, another lane of opportunity for not just these children, these students, but for the teachers themselves professionally. Uh, what's been your assessment of the, the and what's basically accounted for the, the teacher shortage that we see and how we incentivize them uh, and encourage them, particularly in these communities that are so bereft of a uh, quality teacher, like you said, I remember you told me at one point a statistic about the number of teachers in the state or in that county who uh, not even were, you know, qualified to teach AP, but who were teaching math, who were teaching physics, uh, biology. In those specialized areas, the number uh, in terms of shortage is profound. How, what are you seeing in that in that regard? And what are you hearing out of Washington and state capitals uh, regarding addressing some of the, the shortages, uh, whether it's the Biden level administration policies uh, on education um, or or even, um, you know, the state of Mississippi? What's been the response, for example, well, to what you're doing? As, as you know, far better than I do, uh, 
K-12 education is still overwhelmingly a state and local responsibility. So the most meaningful initiatives tend to be at the state and local level. Yep. Uh, there has been, frankly, quite a massive infusion of money uh, in the past two or three years, much of which has been uh, packaged with COVID relief. Uh, the long-term consequences of that, frankly, I'm not sure of because it, it, it is likely to prove ephemeral. Uh, it'll come, it'll go, and it is tough to build permanent solutions based on temporary revenue sources. Mm -hmm. uh, the states are very mindful of this. Uh, uh, Mississippi is, and uh, to their credit, uh, but you know, there's lots of issues. Some of the issues are money issues. Uh, teachers are not paid much money. Uh, Mississippi, for one, recently uh, provided on a percentage basis, which is what it was a significant raise, but in, in absolute terms, it's they're, they're still paid quite little. Uh, uh, and and you know, there, there are, are issues with that. Uh, but at least money. Is, is it is a tough issue, but it's a simple issue. Uh, the way to, to, to come up with more money is to come up with more money. Perhaps the more complicated issue is just relates to rural America generally. Uh, these communities have many, many merits. There are a lot of things that make them special. A lot of things make it difficult to be there. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you are coming out of school uh, and you were among the very, very few physics teachers going into the profession, opting not to go into private industry, where you almost certainly would make considerably more money, where you would face, uh, in many ways, considerably less pressures. Uh, living in a small rural area presents challenges. There's simply no way around it. And it right. presents lifestyle choices. Uh, and it can be you know, again, there are a lot of very rewarding elements, but it's tough. It's tough in these areas. You know, you can't, uh, a lot of things that one takes for granted in more populous areas simply aren't available there. I think that's, again, one of the reasons why I wanted to take time uh, with uh, my with my crew uh, who listen to the Steel podcast uh, to talk about this uh, because, you know, I taught uh, high school when I was an Augustinian seminarian and um, I have a profound love for uh, the teaching profession, especially the the men and women who are on that front line every day. Um, and you, when you have an opportunity to take note of the condition that our students find themselves in and that they're required to try to excel despite the 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 money problems the environmental issues the lack of resources um not having a math teacher in the school building um when your program like this comes along uh, you really want to lift it up and push it out in front of the country to see that there are not just citizens who are willing to concern themselves with what's going on, but they have a strategy, they have a means to bring resources, and they want to try to get it right on behalf of, of these students who otherwise would be left behind. What as you as you are looking at the continued work you're doing, hopefully expanding into other states um, that are in need of the, the global teaching projects uh, efforts, what do you think can be done to set up students to position them uh, in rural communities uh, for success? Uh, what What are some of the elements that you're bringing that may already be there that need to be accentuated? How do you see uh, creating those future lanes of success for these students? Well, the, the, the very first thing is to, to recognize they're there. Uh, because that allows you to direct the resources to them, but more fundamentally to affirm to them that you are very much a, a potentially high achieving student. You can do this. And, and to reach out to them and to say, you belong in, in a high achieving mm -hmm. cohort. Uh, you know, whether you use the word cohort, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> to, to let them know you have a lot to offer. 
and you can achieve quite a bit. And to let their parents know your child has a lot to offer and can achieve quite a bit. And, and if you apply yourself and, and use some of the tools and resources we make available to you, you're capable of extraordinary things. Because I think in, in some ways it is quite an epiphany to these kids what they can do because they've, they've never been asked to do it. They've never been allowed to do it. So the very first task is to, to identify these kids and to let them know you have a lot to offer because they may not recognize it. And until right. they do, you can't take the, the next step. Some of the additional steps, once you do that, and once you get buy-in from the schools, from the parents, uh, and the students themselves are committed, you know, then it is a matter of, of applying resources, which is very hard to do, but it's easier than the first step, which yeah. is to convince these students to, to think of themselves in a different way, uh, that that they are, in fact, a, a, a potentially high achieving student. Uh, and then we can bring the resources and 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 there are specific challenges in rural areas, one very conspicuous one being uh, connectivity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this was appallingly evident during the pandemic. The uh, internet connections in the communities we serve tended to be uh, unavailable, unaffordable, or unreliable. Yeah. Uh, that's still a big issue in rural America, you know, in, in, in that the last mile as the saying goes to get to these communities is very complicated very expensive and and frankly something we are incapable of doing we don't have the means to build out the network well i mean hell we can put a damn uh communication net network that circles the damn planet you mean you can't connect uh you know 3000 counties <laughs> you, you can't you can't connect you know the the poorest rural rural communities in one state. I mean, the, the, again, it's it, for me, and this is one of the things that's always animated me in in, in this space, among some other spaces, is you know, priorities. What's your priority here? I mean, is your priority to educate kids? Okay, then what's the resource checklist that they're going to need to do yeah. that? I mean, so you, you you're not just worried about well, okay. Do kids have laptops? No. All right, get them laptops. Oh, but guess what? They have no internet. So <laughs> what's the point of the laptop? I mean, and so you get into a global pandemic and literally, you know, a third of our students are just off the grid. They're just not even in the game. Yeah. yeah. No, it was in, in some of our, I, I mentioned this one county that had, uh, uh, with with the exception of a tiny uh, county elsewhere, the, the lowest median household income in the country. Guess what? They also had extremely low uh, household internet access. And that was largely because the county didn't have service. And those who, who could potentially buy into a network couldn't afford it in any way. Right. Uh, to, to, to highlight the obvious, we need to fix that. Yeah. And so these students were given episodically, uh, you know, stacks of worksheets that they would be sent home. Uh, it, it was a mess. We persisted. We kept our classes going. One thing I am proud of, I, I don't pretend that it was flawless. I, I acknowledge uh, we threw a lot of stuff against the wall to see what stuck during the pandemic. But I, I, I will say, and as, as I noted, I don't claim credit for things we aren't responsible for. But one thing we did achieve is during the pandemic in the state of Mississippi, excluding our courses, the number of AP offerings, uh, the number of schools offering APs in our subjects declined by over 30%. We went up yeah, because we thought, you know, it's gonna be a mess, but we're gonna keep at it because the kids who are in school this year, they're not gonna be around next year to take it. Or you know, at least they'll be a year older, and and they won't have this opportunity. But particularly, obviously, for seniors, is this year or nothing? Right. So, but issues like internet access were very difficult to deal with, and we did what we could. Uh, I don't pretend we we managed uh, flawlessly because we we did a lot of things. As they say, some of it worked, some of it didn't. But we kept you, kept at it. 
you're you're privately funded primarily uh grants programs uh, how how do how can how can people who want to support this work uh, do that uh, what what are mechanisms here to to help you provide those resources to teach these kids we uh initially were largely privately funded uh initially my own resources then i got some some people to help we have some some uh some folks have really stepped up we did uh after we were up and running a few years uh, uh we applied for a very competitive federal grant which we were awarded uh it is uh a grant frankly we're in the last year of now uh and uh uh we do not and and frankly i'm i'm okay with this although perhaps this will change uh, we do not receive nor have we sought state or local funding because, frankly, you know, in Mississippi doesn't have a lot of money. Right. And and we we went out with the expectation that we wouldn't receive any state or local funding and we have not sought any. As I say, they're sort of in this uh, anomalous position for them that they do have some of the COVID money. But again, that's that's a temporary infusion. So if people... Uh, we're interested in, in, in helping our work. Uh, we, we have a website, uh, the global teaching project.com. Uh, there's a few ways. If you just go to and send an email to info at global teaching project.com. Uh, there's a number of ways people can be helpful. Uh, uh, and you know, we're, we're always looking for, for people who will be helpful to date. Our support has largely been institutional, mm -hmm. uh, or to, to be honest, with some individuals who who have uh, a fair amount of resources. Uh, uh, we have not really sought uh, small individual donations because that that involves a number of things that that uh, uh, we we weren't really prepared to allocate the the. The, the time and resources to pursue that. So we mm -hmm. sort of went for, for larger increments. But if people went to info at globalteachingproject.com who sought to be helpful in any capacity, uh, frankly, we would be interested in, uh, and we receive these inquiries episodically, and we hope to act on some of them soon. Uh, probably the most in common inquiry, which I think is quite telling in its own right, is, hey, we have this problem We've heard about you guys. We have this problem also in, uh, for example, I got an uh, email a few days ago, rural Texas. Mm -hmm. It's Texas, tiny rural area, uh, other parts of the country right. where we have this issue. What can we do? The problem is, we, and, and this gets to your, your point about allocation of resources, to date, the answer is not much. You, there's not a lot of resources out there. Uh, I will note one statistic that that I think you know it, it does speak well of us, but frankly, it probably even more so uh, speaks poorly of of uh, the situation as a whole. And that is, according to recent census data and College Board data, uh, going into the pandemic, the pandemic really scrambled the data. But but basically, the going into the pandemic, two thousand nineteen, two thousand twenty. Uh, uh, of the 25 highest poverty school districts in the United States, thousands and thousands of school districts, of the 25 highest poverty school districts in the United States, of which we serve actually quite a few, the only schools in the country, not in Mississippi, though it is true in Mississippi also, but the only schools in the country that offer either AP biology, AP physics, or uh, AP Computer Science are schools that work in our program. Wow. The only ones in the country. So when these people reach out and say, what can we do? Our answer is, well, we, you know, we we hope to be in a position to help soon. Uh, we're, we're working on it. We, we, we have uh, our next focus uh, where we have made significant inroads and we hope to launch an effort very, very soon is Central Appalachia. And uh, there's a couple other places where there's clusters of high poverty, which in the United States does tend to be, and, and it tends to be overlooked for obvious reasons, because it is far away from the media centers. 
but the highest concentrations of poverty tend to be in rural areas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that is remains our focus. As I say, we're in the Mississippi Delta. We want to move to Central Appalachia, and and build from there. Well, you are you are building it, my friend. Uh, our Secretary of Education, Miguel uh, Cardona, recently said, "Education has the power to bring the American dream within reach of every individual, lift communities, draw people together, drive our economy, and meet our nation's vast potential." I would I would put out there that Matt Dolan and the work of the Global Teaching Project are doing just that. They are helping these kids in rural Mississippi. Uh, begin to tap into their American dream in a way that um, they otherwise may not have been uh, may not have been afforded to them. So, Matt, I really appreciate your taking time to come on to tell us about the Global Teaching Project. Again, you can follow the work, learn more, support uh, the project at www.globalteachingproject.com. Um, write Matt at info at globalteachingproject.com um, and, and learn a little bit more about how maybe you can be a part of, of expanding that opportunity, bringing that American dream uh, to your community uh, as well. Matt Dolan, founder and principal of the Global Teaching Project. Thank you so much for coming on the Michael Steele Project. Uh, Michael Steele Project. Michael Steele Podcast. <laughs> I've, well, thank I've been you, known Michael. To be... <laughs> uh, I, I very, very much appreciate your time, and I appreciate uh, uh, your listeners hearing hearing about our work and hearing about what are really remarkable kids. It, it, it's it's in many ways been a selfish. Uh, undertaking for me because it, it is a cliche, but it's very true that I, I get a lot more out of this than I get into put into it. So well, that I that I know I can assure you that folks, because every time I talk to Matt about and getting updates <laughs> on it, it is very clear uh, how how much this uh, is uh, a passion uh, and and a core a core belief for him in terms of the opportunity that he's creating for these kids um, and that they're creating for him. Um, because they are giving so much back as well. Matt, thank you so much, folks. Uh, that does it for our conversation this time. I always appreciate it when you spend time with me here at the Michael Steele Podcast. Do that download thing, share this podcast. I really appreciate it if you share this one, especially because it is special in a lot of ways um, to hear about the great work of the Global Teaching uh, Project. Uh, and learn more about what they're doing and how you possibly can be a part of that as well. Until next time, um, you know, tell a friend, share us, give us a like uh, uh, and review at Apple Podcasts. And you can reach me on Twitter at Michael Steele and the podcast Twitter at Steele underscore podcast. Until next time, be well, be good. God bless. Mm -hmm.